Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about psychology in UX design. UX stands for user experience. Now, why is it important for us to involve psychology when we're talking about user experience design? That's because humans are complicated. Well, no surprise there. We all are very complicated. We all are very different from one another, different in so many, so many ways. So how will tech company make us choose to use their application? And that's actually pretty easy. That's by influencing the one thing that is common among all of us. Well, actually, that's five things, and that's our senses. Touch, hearing, eyesight, smell, and taste. These are our five senses. These are, the, uh, these are the senses that app developers will use to influence you to make decisions. So touch, hearing, and eyesight are the senses that are available to app developers to influence you. Smell and taste, no, you can't really influence that through an app. Well, you can't smell anything through your phone. And I know when your friend sends you a snap of the food that they're eating, it would be amazing if you could lick your phone and taste the food, but you can't really do that. But to think about it, that's a scary level of technology, to be honest. And would you really want that? All right. So by a show of hands, from a visual perspective, do you think that the food on the right is more expensive? All right. Do you think that the food on your left is more expensive. Okay, so what can we infer from this? The food on the right clearly has lesser food, but since it's presented to you in a beautiful manner and since it has vibrant colors, it's clear to say that user interface and the way it's presented to you is very, very important. So that leads us to beautiful interface. Now, how can we design beautiful interface? That's by, that's by following two important points. How much information you're trying to provide and how are you trying to provide that information? Let's take a look at an example, shall we? Let's look at this menu. There's so much information in the menu. It's so hard for your brain to process all that information on one, at, at one go. So that provides a certain, that kind of in, uh, elicits a certain level of stress on your brain. And that is called cognitive overload. But that doesn't look right. Cognitive overload is the amount of stress that you put on your brain when you're trying to learn new content. So as you saw from the menu, there was just way too much information that was given to you at one go. So it's pretty hard for you to process all that information. As you saw from the previous slide, the colors were just way too bright and was just off. And, and colors can also ta uh, be pretty taxing on your mind. And thus, making a good choice in the amount of information that you're trying to provide and how you're trying to provide that information is very, very important. And that brings us to processing and perception fluency. What is this? This is the ease with which we can process information. And let me tell you, that I'm gonna give you two examples of how information is being presented to you. So these are websites of two tech giants, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, with the design, but it's just two different approaches. Both of these tech companies offer similar functionalities, but it's just the way that they choose to portray it or provide the information to you. I'm pretty sure you've all been on this website. I hope everyone has. So let's look at this, right? There is a search bar right in the middle. There are two buttons, search and uh, I'm feeling lucky. Well, honestly, I've been on this website a billion times. I've not pressed that button at all. So it's pretty clear from the layout that its search, search engine is the primary feature. But they also do offer mail, news, and so many other products, which is conveniently located to the top right-hand uh, side corner, 
and by, by clicking the drop down box and you're free to access it. But let's take a look at this website. They offer a lot of the same features as well, but they're presenting the information to you like this. So the news is right there, the search bar is right there, and all of the information is right there. There's nothing wrong with either of the approaches, but it's just the way it is presented to you that is different. Now I'm gonna ask you guys to please close your eyes for a bit and try to feel the emotion. Try to feel what comes to your mind when I say it. What do you think uh, uh, when I say the color blue? What do you think when I say the color green? Now, what do you think when I say the color red? Now, please open your eyes. Let me tell you what I think, all right? When I hear the color blue, I think of the sky. I think of the sea. It's calming. When I think about green, I think about leaves, I think about open fields, I think about grass, and that's pretty calming as well. But when I think about red, well, where do we see red on a daily basis? We see red in stop signs, we see red in traffic lights. What does it tell us? It tells us to be alert. It tells us to pay attention. It tells us to to be alert and to notice something. And that's why when notifications are uh, provided to us on our phone, it is red in color. So every time you have a notification from a particular app, it's gonna have a badge beside it that indicates that you have a notification. And since it's in red, it's gonna grab your attention. And that's why red is being used. Now, how do you feel when these popular icons are grayscaled? Think about it. Now, how do you f uh, feel about them now? Don't you feel just a bit more excited and a bit more happy to look at them in their associated colors? I do. Uh, let me tell you how important colors are to a company. Uh, over the past decade, I'm pretty sure you've heard about T-Mobile, the famous telecom company. They have sued many companies because they have used similar shades of magenta. And this is how important uh, companies take the colors that they are associated with. Now sound, sound is another way for uh, apps to grab our attention and to elicit involuntary behavior. And let me tell you what I mean by that, all right? So there's this experiment that was conducted in 1890 by a Russian physiologist by the name of Ivan Pavlov. So what he discovered was, was that whenever he fed his dog, he used to ring a bell. And for over the course of a few weeks, he continued doing that. And it came a point where when he removed the stimulus of food and he rang his bell, the dog would start to salivate. Now what does this tell you? It tells you that the, the involuntary behavior of the dog of salivating is now paired with the ringing of a bell. And this is how an involuntary behavior is associated with a neutral stimulus. Let me give you an example. Now, in our phones, when our phone rings, we involuntarily flinch, uh, flinch to our phone. We reach out for it. And that is why it's important to uh, give a good notification sound. Let's take a look at a few popular ringtones, shall we? Now let's try to analyze what's common among these tones. They're all, uh, they, do, they all have high frequency, high pitch, basically. And that's how it creates us to be alert. That makes us alert and that elicits involuntary behavior of reaching out to our phone. And just by hearing that notification tones, you know whether you got a message from Facebook Messenger or a message or a ringtone from Discord and that is the uniqueness of the apps. Now let's talk about responsiveness. 
Humans, as humans, we are habituated to responsive environments, and we want the applications to be more interactive with us. And that's why positive reinforcement are built into applications. Let's take a look at how it is done. For example, on Instagram or any other social media platform, when you like a picture, it's usually accompanied by a vibration or a sound. And this is positive reinforcement. This makes you uh, interact with the app more, want to interact with the app more, actually. And that's a good thing. But also, if you dislike someone's photo or some, uh, some content, you're not going to be greeted with a sound or a vibration because they do not want to associate that with something that you'd want to do. That's how positive reinforcement is done. Now let's talk about positive intermittent reinforcement. Now what is this? There have been many times where I've opened my app, my so favorite social media app, I've just swiped down to refresh the app to get new content and new, uh, new news feed maybe. But not every time do you get new content. This situation is paralleled with the slot machine uh, up in casinos. So what do you do in a slot machine? You put in a token, you pull the lever, and the number starts spinning. Seven, seven, not seven. And you keep doing this, you put another token, you pull the lever, it spins, doesn't work out. But once in a while, it is gonna work out, and you'll feel happy, and you're like, okay, so if I try more, I'm gonna get more wins. And that is the kind of habit that's being uh, paralleled over here to create a sort of an addiction. Now personalization. Personalization is a very, very big, important part of app design. So the app should be able to work better for you, basically. And how is this accomplished? This is accomplished by building a model of you based on what you like and based on what you dislike and based on your interactions with the app. So let me give you an example. So in Spotify, when you first sign up and log in for the first ever time, it's gonna ask you to uh, select five artists that you enjoy listening to, or three genres that you enjoy listening to, and that creates a base model of what your likes are. And as you continue interacting with the app, it would uh, give, it, the model will be better built uh, around you based on your interactions, based on the likes, based on your dislikes, based on the songs that you're adding to your playlist, and all of that, so as to better suggest songs that you would enjoy. Ultimately, the aim is to make an app that would be better for you particularly to use. That's a goal. Now, hedonic adaptation. What is this? This is, let me put it in layman terms, we get accustomed to positive and negative stimulus. So, for example, if I eat cookie dough ice cream every single day for seven days straight, I'm not going to enjoy it anymore. I'm not going to enjoy it as much as I had it on the first day. And that's because that stimulus is no longer providing happiness to me. So that is what hedonic adaptation is, and this will, can be translated in many, many areas in our lives. There's always a genetic set point in the amount of happiness that we do experience on a, on, on a constant level. Good circumstances and bad circumstances do come and go, but that, even if that happens, we would return back to a genetic set point of happiness. So let's take a look at this, all right? This is Fortnite in season one. And this is the lobby of how it was. Uh, this is Fortnite in season eight. Look at the amount of changes. There are a lot of changes, a lot of new cool dance moves for sure. But the important thing to notice is that there have been all these frequent updates to get to this point. And why were there so many frequent updates? That's so that you don't get used to how the app feels. Once you get used to how the app feels, you want, to, you want something else. It's the same thing with me and cookie dough ice cream. Now I, I'm tired of that, I want chocolate chip maybe. So that's how it is. So since by providing more updates, more frequent updates and changing how the game feels for you, they can keep you more interactive with the app. So persuasive design, this is very important as well. This is one way to motivate the users of the app to behave in certain way that the developers want you to behave. You get it? 
So what that means is that, for example, let's take, uh, let's take an example of Instagram, all right? So you've been, sharing photos online has been around for a long time. But then Instagram came in, and uh, sharing photos was never more fun and never more interactive and never more awesome, to be honest. So when you post a picture, what happens? Your followers get notified about it, and every interaction that anyone has on that picture, on that photo or video, you're going to be notified with a prompt of a notification about it. And that prompt will make you personally to interact more with the like or comment or anything that your followers has done to, with your photo. And that is the design of notifications to make you interact with a particular app more. And this is done across many, many apps. So all of this, all of the influence on our senses is to ultimately target the dopamine system in our brains. So what is dopamine? Dopamine is the chemical that is released to make us feel happy. And the ultimate part is, if you feel happy about using an app, you would use it more. And that is what it's all about. So let's talk about social media addiction cycle. Let's see that what happens is, when you perform an action by writing a post or uh, sharing a picture, what you do is, you wait for a reaction. That is what all of us do. I'm pretty sure the day where I post a picture or photo or video, that's the day when I open Instagram like 10 times more than any other day, just to see how I'm doing maybe. So what you do is you wait for a reaction, it creates an anticipation about it, and it goes on. So why is all this so important? Back when phones used to look like this, so uh, all you did was call and S uh, SMS and maybe play the snake game on your phone. And that's pretty much it. But now when phones look like this, what you do is you have 100 other apps out there which are competing for your attention. And all your users' attention is what the companies want and that's what apps are designed for. Now, I wanna leave you all with this quote. There are only two industries that call their customers users, illegal drugs, and software. Now that's something to think about. Thank you.